Hi, everybody. So I'm Sophia Korb, and uh, you might be wondering who am I? Why am I here talking about microdosing? So my mentor is Jim Fadiman. Uh, he's considered one of the fathers of psychedelics research. Uh, he's been one of the world's experts on LSD for the last 40 years or so. He was doing research on LSD and mescaline back before it became illegal to do that research. Um, and since then, people have been writing to him with their stories about trips, about microdosing. Um, and he started introducing that idea to more and more people. And that happened because actually the inventor of LSD suggested that very small doses might be helpful for people for some health benefits. And Hoffman told other people, other people told Fadiman, and so people started writing to Jim with more and more stories. Um, I was a master's student at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, and my background is in economics and math, and not in drug research. Um, and the research group asked me to come on board to do statistics for them. And uh, I needed the money, and so I said, sure, I'll do statistics for you. Um, and at that point, I was completely psych psychedelics naive, uh, and I read more and more stories and did more and more statistics and realized that there is something cool that was happening. And once I got my master's, I became less psychedelics naive. <laughs> um, and uh, after finishing my uh, internships, uh, my clinical practice, uh, clinical internships uh, and practica, uh, I was hired by Jim full time to work uh, as a research assistant and now associate and co-researcher um, on first the high-dose project, and now we've been doing microdosing for the last 24 months. Uh, and we've seen microdosing become, uh, from this niche topic that only we were talking about, to interviews with BBC, The Guardian, Forbes, um, New York Times, the Italian media. So who here has heard of microdosing? Okay. Most people? Who here has tried microdosing? More than half. Um, so people consistently in the media were reporting this as a Silicon Valley phenomenon, um, and it doesn't seem like it's entirely a Silicon Valley phenomenon. So um, Jim, and I, Jim and I are both speaking at different events this week, and he, we traded talks. <laughs> so usually I, um, we, we joke that we're like the X-Files, I'm like Scully, is that right, the, the skeptic? <laughs> and he's like Mulder. <laughs> um, so he's giving the data talk somewhere else, um, and I'm supposed to give like the heartfelt, talking about people's stories. So um, it's a challenge for me, uh, and I'm gonna open myself a little bit more to that. Um, in the way that's what the spirit of microdosing is sort of about, is opening yourself up to a new kind of introspection and doing a self-experiment how would taking a very small amount of psychedelics change who you are and what your experience is? So I'm curious, what have people heard about microdosing? What are the effects of microdosing? Increased creativity. Increased creativity, right? And so we know from high-dose research, Jim's research actually, um, in the 60s and 70s, that giving people very high doses of uh, LSD can help them solve uh, engineering problems in Silicon Valley. Um, and we can see the same thing in microdosing as well. But actually, let's take a step back first. What is microdosing? Is 100 micrograms microdosing? Anyone can offer, can anyone offer any kind of idea? Yeah, so sub-perceptual dosage. So Jim made up that phrase, and we've like since apologized for it. <laughs> um, because obviously, if you've taken something, you know you've perceived that you've taken it. Um, so that, in a way, doesn't make sense. But the idea is that none of the traditional psychedelics effects, so none, not even like, uh, the floor shouldn't appear even a little wavy. <laughs> you should, things should, shouldn't look any different while you're on a microdose. But at the end of the day, uh, you might say, wow, that was a really good day. Um, and you can see in Ayala Waldman's recent book, she read about her own experience microdosing, um, and she had a consistent number of, of really good days. Um, so increased creativity is one thing that people have, it, have reported. What else have you heard about? Uh, emotional sensitivity. Emotional sensitivity, yeah. Um, and s s all of these things can be both good and bad. So you can imagine that for a banker, that increased creativity uh, is, could also be a downside. You can imagine that 
Um, if you're in a marriage with someone that you really dislike, that increased emotional sensitivity would also be a problem for them, right? What else have you guys heard? Amazing sex. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so we've heard from both men and women about increased libido. What else? Antidepressant. Yeah, antidepressant. So on the data side of this, um, we, did, we asked people to fill out surveys every day that they were microdosing, um, including uh, about a bunch of emotions, including some depression variables. We see something like a 50% improvement um, on depression variables, which is very high. Um, I'm going to remind you this isn't a controlled study, uh, but we did have a control group. So people know, they know what group they're assigned to. You know whether or not you've taken LSD or you've just filled out a survey. Um, so the control group, just by filling out these surveys and adding this introspection to their lives, they're improving something like 15 to 20 percent on depression, which itself is very good, right? Just paying more attention to your emotions throughout the day can help with depression. That's a, that's a great result. But we're seeing something like 54% on the people who are microdosing. What about anxiety? What have you guys heard about anxiety and microdosing? Right. So, so for some people it helps, and for some people it, it makes it worse. What we do see is with people who have mixed depression and anxiety, which is basically everyone, um, that if anxiety is the major thing that they're concerned with, that microdosing makes it worse. Um, and if depression is the major thing that they're concerned with, that microdosing makes it better. So in the first few days of microdosing, actually the first like nine to 11 days, we see an increase in the anxiety. And then after that, there's a decrease in anxiety. So people do need to get over this hump of anxiety in order to get the benefits. Um, so I, mean, I have a couple quotes, actually a lot of quotes, from people who are microdosing. Um, and I'm gonna invite um, a very special person in the audience to share. Um, because we initially thought that microdosing would be, uh, we thought that the benefits, based on what Hoffman said, would be around 25 micrograms. Um, and so uh, when I came on to work with Jim, people were sending in handwritten journals. Um, they were mailing handwritten journals to Jim's office, and we were using research assistants to digitize them. Um, and then, you know, my, back, my background is you know, in data. Um, so I was like, Jim, we, we cannot be digitizing people's handwritten journals. We need to have some way of systematizing this. So at this point, I was looking at my Gmail earlier. We have between, it's hard for my Gmail to actually estimate the number of conversations I've had with people over uh, about microdosing, but it's between eight and 11,000 conversations. So um, <laughs> there's a lot of people microdosing or a lot of people talking about microdosing. So we're getting to see some themes uh, of people's experiences, more than just reduced depression and anxiety, but um, more fleshed out, full themes. So I'm gonna read you some quotes from people who are microdosing. Okay, so what we see in addition to the lack of anxiety or reduction of anxiety is an increase in openness. And you can imagine that that could go both ways. So this person said, I have noticed that my mental chatter is considerably less than it was prior to the study. It was near constant before and not very positive. First thing every morning, my mind was always a raging flood of responsibilities, reminders, and thoughts unnecessary. I remember telling my husband, you know that time in the morning when you're almost fully awake, but there's nothing on your mind? I love that. But it was very fleeting. Now my thoughts are quiet and calm with a gentle flow. I'm so grateful. So that's more than just reduction of anxiety, right? That's an increase of experience as well. Um, in addition to that, we see an increase of introspection. And I'm not sure if it's just because we're asking people to reflect on their experiences, but we do see more of this in the people who are microdosing than the people who are just reflecting. So someone wrote, my self-talk feels like it's from a third person point of view. So you can imagine the benefit from being able to look, take a step back and be like, how am I talking to myself? Um, that could have a reduction in a lot of negative things, of depression and anxiety, the ways that we all beat ourselves up all the time. Um, you might have noticed that people shouldn't microdose uh, late at night. Why do you think that is? Yeah, um, so 
most of the things, so most of our data is about LSD and psilocybin mushrooms, but we also have data about like 18 different substances, so like Syrian rue, Hawaiian baby wood rose, morning glory seeds, um, and some of the first research we did was with the Cluster Headache Association called Cluster Busters, which is really awesome, um, and they wanted to, these are people with very, very severe headache disorders. Um, something like 75% of these people talk, um, commit suicide due to how severe their headaches are. Um, and they're seeing a complete remission of symptoms from microdosing. Uh, from, first they saw it from the Hawaiian baby wood rose and the morning glory seeds. But there's some downsides to those substances. Specifically, it can result in blood clots. Um, and you have to get up every hour um, that you're doing the, these so, and walk around so you don't get blood clots. We don't see those same side effects with LSD and, and psilocybin, and people are reporting a complete remission of their headache syndromes. Um, I, I live in Washington, D.C., and I've been talking with the FDA about um, this possibly becoming an approved treatment. The FDA has become very interested when we're talking about very small doses, and they've told me they can't, they can't look at my... They can't officially accept our database because it's people using illegal drugs, but they're... Um, if we publish it, and we are on the open science framework, if we publish it, they're going to incorporate that, that data into their understanding. Um, so that's really positive. Cluster headaches, uh, cluster headaches are so serious that the FDA um, has talked to us about fast tracking this. Um, fast tracking means that we wouldn't have to go through the, the length of time of a regular drug approval, because either because the, the situation is so serious, people um, with that condition or so have such a serious disorder, or all of the approved treatments are related to the thing that, that we're studying. So the treatments for cluster headache syndrome are serotonergic drugs, um, so they're also interested in LSD and psilocybin. If we can get it in small enough doses that people wouldn't be able to say take a month's worth at a time and trip. Because not that I think that tripping is bad, but you can imagine that the FDA does. <laughs> so um, we... The other effect that we were talking about is the increase in energy. Um, because LSD and psilocybin and some of these other drugs are slight uppers, right? Um, so it can keep, keep people up if they were to do it uh, in the afternoon, if they were to take their microdose in the afternoon. We initially told people to take it before noon, and then our current website says to take it before 10 a.m. I think people need to find it, figure out what works for them. If there's some creative it might not matter to them if they're staying up till two in the morning do, doing something creative, but other people have you know, children and have to wake up at five in the morning. Um, staying up till two in the morning drying might not work for their, their lifestyle. So a quote from one person with, who reports more energy, and these are, all, of these quote, all of these themes are reported in over 30% of the people who are reporting to us. Um, I'm feeling very energetic, very focused, very alert. It's the same as taking um, Adderall, but without the jittery or the crash after. So that's wonderful. So you can imagine that, say, taking Adderall has some long-term health negatives. There's also some long-term health benefits. Um, but taking a very small dose of anything is going to, well, I mean, not anything. Uh, taking a very small dose might have fewer long-term effects than taking a large dose of amphetamines every day. Um, someone mentioned the interpersonal or the social benefits to microdosing. So in addition to, say, in this room or the psychedelics interest groups that have popped up that Bradley here has started, um, so you can imagine that there's social benefits to microdosing. You might make a lot of new friends talking about microdosing. Um, but you, you, you can also imagine that it might affect your, your home life and the people around you. Um, we asked people's husbands and wives and children to write in, and people say that they're, the person who's microdosing is more patient with them, which is a really, a really amazing benefit. Um, so one person writes, I have unusually productive and pleasant social encounters with people I don't usually get along with. <laughs> um, so one question I've been asking myself is, how do we compare high dose experiences with microdosing? Are the same benefits that we know that people get from high dose experiences, like a reduction of depression, um, is it the same process by which people are receiving the benefit of microdosing? And I think that's a general question about depression treatment. Like when someone's coming from depressed to undepressed, is it always the same process that gets them out? I don't know. 
I don't, I don't think that they know either because they only have their own experience, right? But we do see some commonalities between um, people who microdose and people who macrodose. So those, those commonalities are, there's a cognitive aspect the same, a thinking aspect that's the same. The people uh, look at the hierarchies, the roles around them, and they think, wow, that didn't make any sense. Like, that's not something that's necessary. I can, I can get rid of that, right? Um, and microdosing might allow people to take that a little slower. That might be better for some people. Uh, you might not want to totally have an upheaval, you know, meet God, um, and change your whole life in a weekend, right? You might want to take that slower. <laughs> so one person wrote, the primary difference I notice is that curiosity outweighed fear. Difficult problems were easy to start. I didn't mind making a mess in order to find and examine solutions. I was eager to get into something and just see where it went, but was also able to clearly form paths in my mind or on paper for possible implementations. So you see that it's not just the breaking down of hierarchies, but it's recognizing new possibilities. Do you want to say something? This comment was LSD. And while people regularly, both in high dose experiences and low dose experiences, say that they can tell the difference between psilocybin and LSD, we cannot tell the difference from our end. Like if I would remove all the references to LSD or mushrooms or psilocybin from the data, um, computer programs cannot tell the difference between the experiences. And what I hear from the researchers at Johns Hopkins and at NYU is that if you keep people from looking at clocks, that if you, they, they can't tell the difference between LSD and psilocybin. Obviously, if people look at clocks, they know that LSD lasts longer. Um, so, the, and often people in mycology in particular say that different types of mushrooms have different feelings, have different energies. That may be true, um, but we can't see it in what they're reporting. So, maybe there's some better way that people could be reporting their experiences and talking about these different energies, or maybe it's Maybe it's their perception. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, it's something that, that bears looking into, especially as we're talking about more and more people microdosing. If different mushrooms have different effects, that's something that we should find out. Because it might be that one type of mushroom works better for one person and another type works better for someone else. Um, it might be that Syrian rue works better for someone else. Um, so we don't know. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't currently know. Another thing is that uh, people start to recognize material that they've forgotten. So childhood traumas or, um, um, so, yeah, childhood trauma, something really bad that's happened, something they, they, didn't, they weren't ready to look at yet. Uh, something in their family, like recognizing, oh, this person played this role in my life and now I'm playing this role in someone else's life. So that's something that people report with high dose experiences and with low dose experiences. So someone says, uh, I think this one is a psilocybin one. Um, I noticed the anxiety is gone. I felt clear and full of energy. My depression has been causing me to drift away from friends and family at an alarming pace over the past two years, often feeling great anger towards family and frustration towards friends. The first time microdosing almost instantly gave me the urge to reach out to my friends and family. It's like I felt anxiety, but without the anxiety. So maybe that increased energy. Um, it's a very strange sensation for me. The next few days I felt very chilled and relaxed and with no anxiety or fear. Uh, another thing that people report, yes, go ahead. I do. <laughs> One sec. I have all my regular slides that, that Jim is presenting. <laughs> okay, so if you have a specific problem or issue you'd like to treat or you... Um, no, no, so we, what we ask people is, do you have a specific problem or issue you'd like to treat? Would you like to enhance your well-being or creativity or participate in a comparison group? And we see about 65% uh, about of people say that they're... Um, want to improve their physical or mental health because of an issue, and about a third of people were saying that they want to enhance their wellness or creativity. Um, and that's out of um, 6,000. So uh, another theme that you might imagine is that there's increased flow. So who, 
who has heard of the concept of being, yeah, of flow, being in the zone, right? So it's this idea that you don't have self-awareness, that the task itself is so hard that all of you is engaged in it. And people report that, um, surgeons report it, you know, people delivering babies, you know, I'm sure that people have had their own experiences of doing something and getting it into a flow state. Um, so people report that on high dose experiences and they start to report it on these microdosing experiences too. Uh, so we have this quote, the way I do my job has changed a lot. Earlier I used to be overly focused, uh, losing myself in my screen and thoughts for hours and hours. It's hard to describe and even harder to find an explanation for how easily I get things done now. It's like I get more work done at a higher quality while taking less effort. I have mental clarity and I'm able to more easily take a step, take a few steps back and adjust the right things. Another part is my improved social and communication skills. This helps me match the right people to get work done that I'd previously do myself. Emotionally, I'm more balanced, no more depressed episodes. I actually feel blissful a lot of the time. My creativity is heightened and I'm writing more because I'm no longer tired after work. So those are some really positive aspects of microdosing. Uh, so obviously, as you can imagine, we're talking to people about microdosing, people are doing these self experiments. The people who keep on talking to us are the people who microdosing works for. So what I've been doing recently is following up with people who dropped out, um, who, people who stopped microdosing for whatever reason, um, and trying to find out why they stopped so that we don't lose all that data. Um, so I've been doing a, a survey with lots of people who stopped microdosing um, or adjusted their microdosing schedule. So we initially thought that LSD stayed in the body for a couple days. So we suggest that people microdose like every three days for 30 days and report their emotions on, on daily. Um, and then afterwards we asked them what they did. So people who microdosing worked for, for whatever reason, which is a lot of people, uh, the schedules that they usually take are once a week or once a month. So I don't know, is Rotem here? I think Rotem has some theories about why, why people microdose at different schedules. And I think that you found another effect also, that every two weeks? No, there, there were two main months, one, one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that people um, who are microdosing for maintenance, maybe, are microdosing once a week. Um, I think people who are microdosing once a month are maybe doing it to enhance creativity. I'm not sure. Um, I think that a lot of the people who are uh, migraine and cluster headache uh, syndromes are microdosing once a month just to abate their, their, their symptoms. And I think we'll hear more about that soon. Um, so as far as the negative aspects of microdosing, why did people stop microdosing? So people, um, so people say they gave them too much energy. It gave them too much energy. They felt too, too energized, too excited. Um, people said that it, um, it was too, made them feel too alive. And it, <laughs> um, it was something that they weren't ready for. Uh, it made them question their relationships with their spouse, um, and they weren't ready to have those conversations. It made them question what they were doing for a living. Um, <laughs> so one of my major concerns going into this was that microdosing is a Silicon Valley you know, phenomenon. People are microdosing for creativity to be more productive in the workplace. But when we asked people why microdosing didn't work for them, they said, because it brings up too many emotions about how my job isn't good for me. So I'm not sure how effective it is um, for jobs that people don't like. <laughs> um, I'll get you in one sec. I know some people who have stopped microdosing because of difficulties with access mm -hmm. to medicine. Um, and that also makes me wonder about how you control for the quality of medicine that people are getting because it's great their needs. Yep. That's a great question. So how do we control for the quality of medicine that people are getting? Um, so the type of research or search that Jim and I have been doing doesn't control for that. And that's why it's very, very important that people take our findings and do randomized control trials with known substances um, so that we actually find out scientifically what is happening. Because otherwise, we're not going to know. Um, we encourage everyone to get testing kits. 
um, so that they know what they have, but we don't know exact dosages and we don't know exactly what people have. And yes, so uh, not having access to whatever people were microdosing with was one of the reasons why people stopped. Concerns about legality. Um, there were some concerns about uh, a heart problem uh, that have mostly been scientifically uh, addressed at this point, but some, some people were concerned about having valve problems with their heart, so they stopped because, I mean, if this is a, a thing that, keeps, that makes people slightly more anxious, and then they hear about a valve pathology, you can imagine that that made them stop. Um, so those are some of the reasons why stop, people stop microdosing. Some people said, I tried to microdose to stop a migraine and it didn't work. All right. Um, so it, that didn't work for them, and I think that that's, that we don't have any migraine treatment that fully, um, that fully addresses all migraines, and that's why it's a really important issue to have more and more migraine treatments. So I want to invite one of our, uh, a person, a very special person to us, to speak. Um, we were concerned, one of our concerns was that people would get addicted to microdosing, and use escalating high and high, higher and higher dosages to get the same effect. That isn't what we saw. We saw people using less and less, more and more rarely most of the time, um, and then adjusting their dosages on their own. I think that it's really important that microdosing, that up until now microdosing has been this personal self-experiment, um, introspective thing that people are adjusting on their own. Um, and I'm not sure that the FDA and other uh, national health research approval agencies are going to go for like they can adjust their own dosage, but we'll see. Um, and I want to invite Donna to share. So I, th I think I'm here because of an error um, that my husband, who was a physician, made when we were preparing our microdose when we began to do the study uh, for Jim, with Jim. And about halfway through our first 30-day trial, um, we realized that rather than taking 10 micrograms a day, which was what the recommended dose was, we had been taking one microgram a day. But we were writing great notes at night and, have <laughs> <laughs> and having really wonderful results. And um, I had, um, I had been, su I'm 72 now, and starting when I was about 32, I started suffering from quite significant migraines, not cluster migraines, N not blinding light, vomiting, but three times a month for three days at a time, I was in a lot of pain, I was in a lot of tension in my neck, and I just had a total malaise. I, I, I felt sick, very sick. And at the end of the month, my husband said, I didn't want to mention anything because I didn't want to blow it for you, but have you noticed <laughs> that you haven't had a headache? all month, and I said, oh yeah, I noticed that. I had had n not absolutely nothing. And so we confessed to Jim that we had been taking one microgram instead of 10, and he was very, very excited about that and said, you stay that way, and anyone you bring in to this study, you will be the one microgram subgroup. And so I went, um, aside from many, many other wonderful benefits. Um, I went headache free for two years. Absolutely nothing on one microgram every third day. I then started having um, some breakthrough headaches and I decided to increase my dose to uh, two micrograms. I thought, hell, I got a long ways to go to 10. <laughs> I'm old, so maybe I won't get there. And uh, so I started to, to take two micrograms a day, and I got about another eight months. And then again, I started having an occasional headache. I'm currently taking three micrograms every three days. And maybe once every two months, I will start into a headache process. It's not as severe as it was before. And when it happens, a little bit of cannabis just takes care of it. And I'm a very happy camper. So that's my story. So, Donna, thank you very much. So, Donna is one of our, what Jim has been calling the mini microgram, mini microdose. Um, I initially 
definitely thought they'd be more measuring wrong uh, because people were saying they took one microgram uh, and not not you but another another couple actually um, the husband was a chemist so <laughs> um, my whole thing that he was probably measuring the doses wrong didn't pan out because he probably got it right so we have a group of say seven people now who are in the between one and five micrograms, um, which is very, very low. Um, it's not clear what's happening. It's very cool. Uh, sorry, guys. Legally? Daily. Uh, no, the, it's every three days or once a week or however people want, however people, after people have done this 30-day thing, then they can, people choose whatever they want. Um, and right now, so we've ended these daily emotion studies, and right now we're handing off uh, a bunch of data to Open Science Framework and the Global Drug Survey, and we're doing some planned follow-ups uh, with certain patient groups, so people with, uh, people with herpes zoster, so people who get shingles, uh, which is uh, an after outbreak of ch the chicken pox, um, can get nerve damage, which is extremely painful, um, and there aren't really good treatments for it. <laughs> I've you know, been speaking at conferences for a couple of years now. Um, and people keep on coming up to me and hugging me and crying about their herpes zoster, about their, uh, their shingles being cured by microdosing. <laughs> um, that's very cool. Uh, and we're not totally sure what's happening. So we're doing a, a follow-up group of the people with, with that. Um, there's a group of people with paralysis um, who, and with amputations. One of the issues sometimes with amputations is that people um, have phantom limb pain. So they have, um, they, you know, they don't have this hand anymore, but it, they, it feels cramped to them. Um, and it's very hard to address to uncramp a hand that doesn't exist. Uh, and there's some things that you can do with mirrors and uh, some cool neuropsychology tricks, but uh, microdosing is really effective for that group of people. We're not quite sure what's happening. Um, we're doing a follow-up with people with traumatic brain injury, and we're doing a follow-up with people with bipolar. Uh, I think I don't know all the patient groups, but there's around six follow-up groups that we're um, asking people questions about right now. Uh, Jim and I are very happy that uh, to hand over the microdosing project now to the randomized control trials that are happening um, of both high and low dose um, LSD and psilocybin in a number of different countries. Um, and it's been, a really, it's been a really fun time. Um, I never thought that as you know, a psychologist and a data scientist that I would talk so much about drugs and get so many hugs from, from people talking to me about their drug experiences, but it's been really uh, a beautiful and opening experience. So Jim encouraged me to leave lots of time for people to ask questions. So I think we have 10 minutes, five minutes? Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you repeat it? Yes. Oh, yes. It, it has gone both ways. That people said that they realized when they were microdosing that they're married to the wrong person. <laughs> And people have, uh, and people have said, "Oh no, I love my sp spouse a lot more. Uh, better conversations. The spouses report that they're more patient." Yeah, but it's a, it's a more one than the other. I think that the ways that we survey people are going to have more positive experiences than negative experiences because people want to talk to us about positive experiences. That's part of why I've done this follow-up with people who. Um, didn't continue microdosing, so that we don't lose that, that part of the picture. Excuse me, I have bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. and when I flash things, sometimes it makes me totally mad. Mm -hmm. Is that because I'm too mad? Uh, I definitely don't know. But is there, like, can you tell me how microdosing applies for bipolar? Yeah, so one of, one of the concerns that we have is that uh, in general, is that with people with bipolar or people with underlying uh, psychotic uh, disorders, that any use of psychedelics could trigger those. Um, what people with bipolar have said in our studies, it's been actually really great. Um, 
the people contacted me and said, is it the, the season was changing? And they were afraid they were going to come back while they were microdosing. Is it okay if they reduce the amount of microdosing they were doing? And I said, yeah, of course. And I talked to people's physicians and people's psychiatrists um, about what was going on. And we talked about how to tell if you're becoming an addict um, and how to reduce your, your dosage down. Um, and we haven't had anyone become manic or have a psychotic episode on um, of these 8,000 people. Um, in, yeah, we haven't had anyone have a, a manic or psychotic episode. So I don't know if it's about the dosage or I don't know if it's about people knowing that they should stop. Uh, and if people have the, have the introspection and have the self-knowledge that they shouldn't do mushrooms because it will make them manic, I you know, respect your own wisdom. Thank you. Uh, what about the interaction with pharmaceuticals like antipsychotics and SSRIs? Do you have any data on that? I do, yeah. So our website has a list of 140 different medications and supplements that people use together with microdosing that didn't present a problem. Um, we were concerned about lithium, but everyone, there's like 20 people with lithium who um, did microdose and didn't have a problem. But we were concerned because of high dose um, LSD and lithium together can cause seizures, even though both lithium and LSD don't cause seizures on their own. Um, so we were concerned about it, and we talked to people's doctors and talked to people about not microdosing if they were lithium, but they did anyway. <laughs> Uh, if we publish? Yeah, yeah. I mean, are, are people going to your website to find out, like, like if I have traumatic brain injury and I can go to your website and I was thinking about how to go to them, and I find suggestions? Yeah. Like, um, or is it published in papers and I have to dig in PubMed? It's both. So you can both find it in on PubMed and you can go to our website and see more. We're starting this follow up these follow-up studies this month. So there will be something with about traumatic brain injury and a, a, a link to, to click and do a survey about people with traumatic brain injury, whether or not they've microdosed and what their experience has been. Could you put your website up for mm -hmm. okay. Yep, I will. Did you get any well, we basically assume that all of our communications are monitored. Um, so we don't ever tell people to do illegal things or encourage people to do illegal things. Uh, in many of the places where people are microdosing, psychedelics are illegal. Um, we encourage people to take whatever security precautions they need to. We encourage people to talk to us using a code name if they want to. Use Tor to talk to us. Um, we have not run into any illegal problems. Um, and we haven't had, except for people not having access to psychedelics, none of the participants have had legal problems either. I um, recognizing the impact on focus and flow, uh, and also recognizing that a lot of people who suffer from PhD also you know, have anxiety or depression. Have you actually noticed um, or have you considered a possible benefit, given that also the stimulant aspects of LSD for treating ADHD or reducing ADHD symptoms? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's possible that it's working for people for ADHD symptoms because it's a stimulant. Um, people definitely reduce the amount of Adderall and Ritalin and other stimulants that they take while they're microdosing, which is probably good because like adding more and more uppers will get people to talk really fast and more anxious. Um, so people are definitely choosing microdosing over those other pharmaceuticals um, in terms of treating their ADHD symptoms. I think we're noticing with the uh, children of uh, families that are in the process of getting divorced or are in the have been divorced, the children are actually traumatized in certain ways. They uh, manifested physical issues, including anxiety. So, so the other things that are actually on you know, pharmaceutical drugs. With microdosing, say, for a child, do you have any data on that? Have we affected? Uh, don't give drugs to children. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, very serious about this. Um, we don't know the effects of um, drugs on developing brains. If you have met a child, uh, they're already tripping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't need drugs. 
Um, I cannot recommend doing um, psychedelics to children in any way. Um, we don't have people. We don't have people who might daily. Actually, no. no. We encourage people to take breaks. Um, we had some people who were doing five days on, two days off, which was like the Paul Stamets's protocol. They told they, most of them got off of that because they felt like it was too activating. Mm -hmm. Some in the back, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, do you see the microdosing? Has anybody been warning you to get for sport Yes. Um, <laughs> with, Jim just met with um, the WWE. Is that a thing? And the rest of the people? Um, uh, to talk about getting microdosing banned as a performance enhancing drug. Um, because wrestlers were microdosing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, people were using it. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, and also, both athletic performance and musical performance, people were reporting that it uh, opened their throats more. People sent sent me like these recordings of them singing. <laughs> it's great. Definitely don't know enough about vocal performance to be able to say like, oh, this one was with microdose and this one wasn't. <laughs> they they say that it was a bad thing. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, maroon shirt. Yeah. Are there any examples of where um, application of psychedelics or use of psychedelics in the control of community level have been studied? How it enhances social dynamics within the community? Uh, not any recent ones. There might be some from the 60s. Um, yeah, not any recent ones. Do you guys have any data of like, people who've had seizures in the past? No, we have information about people using it instead of antidepressants, instead of um, Adderall and Ritalin, like medications, but we don't have any information about anti epileptics. Mm -hmm. Did you do any studies on how uh, microdosing and the We did not, and that is because Jim is very good at um, seeing MDMA as a psychedelic. Um, and I think that that has to do with the history of psychedelics in the 60s and 70s and the influence of um, speed in San Francisco and how that changed the community on Pete Street. But uh, the, Jim does not consider MDMA a uh, psychedelic and the MDMA is not being included in our study. I'm wondering about a combination of a long-term So our, our initial study, we, you know, I didn't think about asking people if they were producing at the same time. Um, so we didn't get collect that data in the initial surveys. Um, we're collecting that with the follow-up information yeah. to find out if people were also macrodosing at the same time. Because right now it's very hard to sort out if they were, whether or not the benefits that are seen are from people macrodosing as well. Oh yeah, it's definitely a confounding factor. We just I just didn't think about it when we designed the first yeah, sure. yeah. Well, somebody can't run a double one just because it's so great. It's famous with both sometimes. we can't run a we can't run a double blind because we aren't that kind of researcher. We're this other kind of survey researcher called preclinical. Uh, preclinical researchers, and we are handing stuff off to clinical researchers now um, so that people are running randomized control trials uh, in the next two years. Do you want to do like two more questions? Sure, let's do two more questions. Um, I feel like I haven't taken a lot of questions from women. Yeah, okay, so it seems to me like the, pretty much probably the future of uh, microdosing will be the door, the door of enter. Um, well, the question here is how do we keep it from not being just taking like a pill 
How do we apply a little bit of consciousness to these medicines, to microdosing, and still uh, have the consciousness of the plant? Mm -hmm. I think that, that that's a problem that we don't know the answer to yet. Uh, I think that's something that we should consider is that um, if people are taking this as medication, um, especially if they feel like it's recommended to them by a doctor, uh, that that has a certain power structure and creates a certain type of experience, and that if people look at it a different way, say as a sacrament, as part of a spiritual community, uh, that they might have a different experience, um, I think it would be very hard for us to impose that as researchers, uh, but starting to ask people about the context in which they do it, encourage people to think about different contexts, um, to play around in different contexts, so you know, bring an open mind, open heart to this, is something that, that we could be doing. Alright, are there any other women? Yes? Um, I was curious because I uh, heard you mention that over time people would refuse the amount that they might grow uh, for certain things, but also I can't remember the lovely lady that was up there speaking about her migraines. Mm -hmm. um, she said she was kind of increasing over time, and I was wondering what trends you saw in people kind of increasing, and for what, and what you see people increasing. Sure, so in general, people haven't increased past uh, a certain amount, partially because we won't, wouldn't consider them to be microdosing if they're increasing past, say, 25 mics. Um, people with autism spectrum disorders um, often write to us and say, um, it takes me a lot of, like, it takes me a lot of psychedelics in order to macrodose, in order to trip, so can I also microdose at the same ratios? Like, if it needs me, 500 mics to trip, so I also multiply the, the microdose by five. And at some point, it's just not responsible for us to call that a microdose and say that like people should not be driving and they should not be considered affiliated with, with us if they're considering themselves a microdosing at 125 mics. Um, <laughs> it's super dangerous. Um, so, for whatever reason, people with autism spectrum disorders seem to need more psychedelics to get the same effect. Um, we don't, so in general, people don't, don't increase or don't increase past a certain amount. Um, and people do decrease. Um, people regularly report that, say, 15 or 10 is too activating and are reducing past that. 